and welcome to the special simulcast of the Neil Haley Show and Doc Tales. I'm excited to welcome the host of Doc Tales, World Doc, Alan Lindman. Doc, what's going on? How are you? We're doing really well here, Neil. And you? Very good. And our guest today is Lisa Boat. And Lisa's going to talk about menopause. And she's a menopause expert and coach. How are you, Lisa? Thanks for stopping by. I'm great. Thanks for having me. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. All right, Doc. What is your first question for Lisa? Well, Lisa, I've been to your site. It's beautiful. And you've done a great yeah. job with it. You're well organized. And I can see why people uh, get enthused by, you know, going to your site. You have a lot of things to offer. But, you know, you talk a little bit about how you came to doing what you're doing. But if you could tell me a little bit more, I'd be really interested in your personal story. Well, thank you. Yeah, my personal story is a bit of a winding road as to how I got here. Um, and it started, you know, as, as it does for most in our early 20s when we choose what we want to do. And so I became an educator. And I was an educator for 20 years. And in the last few years of my career, I two things happened simultaneously. One, my, my children, like my own children here at home, were entering into their late teen years. And so I was starting to experience the empty nest. And I didn't realize how extreme that shift was going to be. I thought it would be more of a gradual shift and change. And it was not at all. It was almost as significant a shift as when you first have a, a baby at home. And there's, but there's not a lot of support at this end of parenting. There is for prenatal and postnatal, and that's essential. And there's not a lot of narrative or conversation around what it's like to be a mom and a woman in this phase of life. And to be honest, I actually remember really clearly, I was sitting with a cup of tea on the back deck of my house. And I thought, I'm on the other side of everything I have ever imagined for my life. How is this possible? Because I am, I am this person right now, and there's a lot of life to live, and I don't even, I've never even considered it. So while that was happening in my career, I also was noticing things like it was taking so much energy for me to get out the door every morning. And things that used to be sort of like minor annoyances were causing this like overwhelming sense of rage to the point where I was losing my hair and I was having panic attacks at work and I was crying in my car every day. And I came to the realization that I couldn't live this way anymore. If I actually wanted to live, I couldn't keep doing it. So I resigned from teaching. I started coaching in the empty nest space. And then I realized because I like to take a holistic approach, there was always phys physical symptoms coming up with the people I was working with. And so I, and I was noticing what was happening in my own body. So I got my menopause coaching certification and through that process realized that what was happening in those last few years of my career, and again, not that I would change it, not that I would change my decision because there were lots of factors, but perimenopausal symptoms were playing a role in what was, I was experiencing in all of the transitions that were happening in my life. And I didn't even know about it. Wow. You know, and thinking about specifically enough, why is there not enough education for menopause? Like, like really, especially when you're getting closer to that time. It's a great question and it, ha it doesn't have an easy answer, but part of it is women's bodies are difficult to study because we are all like every woman's experience of perimenopause and menopause is different and unique. And so if you are looking for a consistent sample in research, women are not, are not an easy group to work with. So there is some research, there is a burgeoning research. There is a lot more that is going into this area of study at this point in time, but there was not consistent knowledge or understanding really about what happens in women's bodies at, at this transition. Now, yeah. all right, good doc. What, what next question you have for, well, you know, what, what should women think about when they're getting into menopause? And, you know, you hit on a really important point. It's different for everybody. So that's a big problem. It's hard to design a program that's good for everybody 
uh, when everybody's different. But do you have any recommendations for what you would tell women who were about to have an empty nest or about to uh, get into perimenopause or who are in perimenopause? Yeah. So there's actually two components to that answer. So the first one is for women who are actually at that stage, listen to your body and trust what it is telling you, right? Hormones are the great messengers of our body. They are what make it impossible for us to ignore what perhaps we've been ignoring for a really long time. So it is knowing that your body is communicating to you and listening to it and then responding in ways that actually care for your body. So in, you know, when I think about my own experience, um, the mental health elements of it are also really under, under talked about, under discussed. And so listening to what your body is saying, like what is what are the shifts that you are noticing in your mental health or in your cardi cardiac health or however it is that it's manifesting for you and listen and respond. Don't keep ignoring it because if you ignore it, this journey will be even more uncomfortable than it already is. And then the other element is that women need to know about this before they are entering into perimenopause and menopause. Yeah, okay. they need to get ready. <laughs> Absolutely. Because the core four elements of moving through perimenopause and menopause well are the same core four for almost everything in terms of health. Stress management, sleep, nutrition, nutrition, and movement. And the earlier you have those practices in place, the more you have to draw on. Right. So it's like making an investment in your overall health and well being. And when you start doing that in your younger years, then you have a deeper well to draw from as you are moving through this really challenging time. Well, it sounds like you're giving a lot of thought to this. And uh, I think you're, you know, you are doing some presentations. And uh, so that's certainly worthwhile. Um, you know, when people ask you about, you know, the traditional doctor treatments, the primer and the progesterone, the, you know, whether you take it by mouth or whether you put it on your skin, what do you tell them? Um, so again, it goes back to everyone's journey is totally different. And if you are experiencing symptoms that are really debilitating or that are really like getting in the way of you being able to live your life, then hormone therapy is a really valid option that will make a big difference. So it's, but it is a process of trial and error. Like you said, there's a number of different delivery methods, right? And, and getting the levels right between estrogen and progesterone can take a little bit of time to figure that out. So again, it's going back to like, if you, if you're starting hormone therapy, really pay attention to what's happening in your body. Where are you feeling better? Where are you not feeling better? Keep note of those things and continue to advocate for yourself with your healthcare practitioners. Because just because it doesn't work right away doesn't mean that it won't. It just means that it might take a little bit more time and trial and error to find the right way, whether it's through the skin, whether it is taking it orally, whether it's a suppository, whether it's a cream and getting that balance of estrogen and progesterone right will take some time. Like I said, I sound like a broken record sometimes, but every woman's body is so different that it just, it takes a little bit of time to do that, but it is you know, there's, I'm sure you're very well aware that there's a lot of misinformation around hormone therapy from that study that came out in the early 2000s. And so there's a lot of fear around hormone therapy still. And I, it is not my place to say you absolutely should, or you absolutely should not. What I do is provide information that allows you to make an informed choice. Right. And it's having that informed choice that's so important. Yes, informed consent. It's a big deal. And the study you're talking about at WHI, and yes, I think it was just one more, a new way to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, go figure. It's going to change the way uh, people are on medicines and different things. If we do, they're not going to be as medications. There's not going to be as much 
depression if we can figure this out earlier. We can, all these different things. This is why you bring these things to the table that are so, so important because a lot of people don't discuss it. And then once they've already gone through the this part before menopause comes, they're not ready and they think it's over. It's what's going to happen in my life. Yeah. And they don't have the resources available to know they can shift back. You can shift back to being younger. We don't, we don't teach that. You know what I mean? We don't teach that it, regardless of male or female, that if you start aging, there's a way to decrease the aging, but you talked about those four ways of doing it. And then mm -hmm. so really uh, kind of the whole lifestyle has to be part of the whole process. And that, and if you don't okay. have a lifestyle style, forget it. Right. Yeah, so absolutely. They, they absolutely go hand in hand. Like, even if you are on homework hormone therapy, I still with work, work with women through the lifestyle changes because it's not a magic fix, right? And no, just like all. With, all, with all medications, if the lifestyle part isn't in place, then you're gonna need to keep having higher and higher dosages as your body shifts and change and adjusts. And when, but when you are working with the lifestyle changes as well, it makes that transition so much smoother and it's just, it's good for every system in your body in general. And one of the, one of the things that I think is really important to talk about is that the sort of traditional symptoms that everybody talks about and often are the butt of the joke when we're talking about menopause and perimenopause it are hot flushes and night sweats, right? But those are actually vasomotor events occurring in your body. And that's not a joke. It is a very strong message from your body saying, things are changing in here. Your cardiovascular system does not have the same protection that it used to have because estrogen has protective factors for every system in your body, every single one. And so the movement and nutrition and stress management, those are ways that we support our cardiovascular system, that we support our mental health um, along with any other medication that we may choose to take. And so it's the combination that's really, really key. All right. All right. So doc, last question you have for Lisa. Uh, well, <clears throat> there could be several, but I, what do you think about the alternatives? For example, uh, the psychotropics, the SSRIs, do you think there's a place um, in the management of this for, for women? That's a really interesting question. And I'll be very honest and say it, that was not part of my training. Um, I think that it is interesting when we think about the levels of shame and anxiety that exist around this transition that happens for women. And so there's I mean, there's potential and possibility that that may be really helpful in helping women move through that and move through that anxiety to move through the shame that exists and the, you know, the lifetimes of trauma that we've all experienced <laughs> that have gotten us to here uh, that may be freeing for moving forward. It's actually one of the things that I love about this stage and one of the ways that I position it is why my business is called liberated menopause, right? Like this is actually not the end. This can be a really beautiful beginning where you get to be really deeply present to yourself and to your body and to give to yourself in ways that perhaps you never have. And so it gets to be the time where you get to choose to live for yourself. So if that is a, a modality of treatment that works for someone, then I would hold that space for them to do that. Excellent. All right. So Lisa, the best place people can find information on you, where can they go? Uh, my website is a great place, liberatedmenopause.ca. You can find me on Instagram at lboat uh, and all of the rest of my contact information is in those places. All right. Thanks again, Lisa. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. All right, that was a special simulcast of the Neil Haley Show and Doc Tales, guys. Take care.